Good day, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Land Fricker Talks. I'm your host, Chris, and for those who are new, this show provides a platform for voices to be shared across an array of subjects like AI, linguistics, data governance, and much more. Our vision is to amplify underrepresented voices in AI and establish an accessible online repository of knowledge for these important but often neglected areas. Subscribe to our podcast and YouTube channel for more exciting talk shows. Today, we're very excited to have Denise DePrecio, Associate Director at Linguistic Data Consortium. Um, Denise is responsible for the overall operations of LDC's external relations group, which includes intellectual property management, licensing, regulatory matters, publications, memberships, and communications. Before joining LDC, she practiced law for over 20 years in the areas of international trade, intellectual property, and commercial litigation. She has an AB in political science from Brian Mayer College and a Juris Doctor degree from the University of Miami School of Law. We're very, very excited to have you, Denise, and the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and to have an opportunity to talk to the uh, to talk to your audience about LDC and then um, specifically African language resources. Um, so thank you again for having me. Um, first, um, here's a quick overview of um, what I'm going to talk about today. You can advance, Chris. Yes, thank you. Um, so we'll start with um, uh, a short summary about LDC's founding and its mission, uh, then um, focus on the catalog, what it looks like, how to search it. Um, we'll then um, dive into the African languages resources that are available from LDC. Um, I'll then have a few thoughts on the challenges of research in African languages based on LDC's um, experience there, uh, and then end with um, uh, some tips on how you can share uh, your data through LDC. Um, so um, here, LDC was founded actually over 30 years ago now. Um, and is hosted at the University of Pennsylvania in the United States. Um, it's a consortium, which means that the idea is that those that benefit from what it does uh, support it. And uh, the members of our consortium are global organizations from academia, industry, and government. So what was happening in 1992? I think you know there was the time of growing computer, computing power, um, people had always been interested in automatic language systems, but the fact that computers were getting better made that a little, made that more possible. And um, at the same time, the, the community realized that people were creating their own proprietary data sets and were not sharing them. And there could, and there were many reasons for that. Some of them were practical, some of them could be legal, some of them were just um, uh, a disinclination to share their work broadly. So um, that's when the idea evolved that there should be an organization that served as a permanent data repository and distribution point for language resources. And that's how that's how LDC came into being from a federal government call. Um, and Penn was chosen as the host institution. So, um, and then shortly after, uh, LDC seemed to be a good choice for also undertaking data collection uh, and annotation and leading to further research. And so data sets that LDC developed through its um, sponsor projects also um, became part of the catalog. But the main feature of LDC is the catalog because D stands for data, we're all about data. So basically the catalog launched when it launched in 1993, it was seeded by data contributions of data sets that were already, um, had already uh, been developed and in some cases had already been distributed in some way. And again, um, supplemented uh, soon after with data developed by LDC. But it's always been the case and remains so today that the backbone 
the backbone of the catalog is on data that's donated from researchers around the world. So it's something that we're committed to doing and one that we encourage um, all in the community to think about doing. Um, from the beginning, um, the licensing model was something that was important. And, uh, and so it was decided that um, data that would be licensed from LDC could be used for language related education, research and technology development. That's still the case today, over 30 years later, we think that use is broad enough to cover the ways in which the field has developed, um, including into you know, AI, not to mention uh, NLP, human language technology development, et cetera. So let's take a little closer look at the catalog. Um, it grows every year. So as of September, and we're just in the beginning of, you can go back, Chris. Thank you, sorry. Chris is advancing the slides for me because I have some technical issues sometimes when I try to do that on a Zoom meeting. Um, so um, as of September, and here we are in October, but the statistics are, are still the same, we have 944 public online resources that cover variety of data types, speech, text, video, images, and lexicons in over 100 languages. Those of you who've done some work in areas like parsing or speech recognition or otherwise may recognize some of the benchmark data sets that are in our catalog like Penn Tree Bank or Switchboard. Um, but in any event, we have distributed since 93 over 212,000 copies of data to more than 6,000 organizations around the world. And our catalog is recognized as a core trust seal repository. This is a certification that's provided by the ISCU World Data System and the Data Seal of Approval, which is a Netherlands organization. But what it means is that LDC's catalog is a trustworthy data repository because we meet high standards for things like access and rights management, preservation and storage. Um, and consistent with that, consistent with the idea that we follow best practices and uh, international guidelines, I wanted to just emphasize the FAIR principles, which I think many of you've heard about. Um, this is something that I think the global community is very interested in with respect to data. And FAIR stands for uh, the idea that data should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So now we're gonna take a look at the catalog search page um, <clears throat> to illustrate the different ways that you can find LDC resources. So you can see that the catalog is searchable by various fields. Um, the name, if you know the title or a portion of the title of the corpus, the author, keywords in the description, uh, our catalog number, but then also other things. You can search by language. You can search by data type, what's called DCMI type. That's a term of art in um, archiving library systems, um, and so on. So now we're going to take a look in more specifically at a at one catalog entries. What do you see when you when you find uh, when you find uh, a corpus in the catalog that you're interested in looking at? So um, I've chosen B the Bamanicon lexicon, which is um, a lexicon, uh, Bamanicon is a Manding language spoken in West Africa, and uh, this was published in 2016. So I chose it as an example of what you would look, what you would see in the top level metadata uh, on the catalog entry. Below this metadata, what you would then see would be a narrative description of um, the corpus, and below that, you would see um, a small data sample that you could take a look at. So we see that the Corpus is named, that it has an author, and there's lots of other information there about it, what languages, uh, what languages it is, um, et cetera. So I wanted to point out a couple of things. First, the presence of persistent identifiers. In this case, this cattle, this cat, this particular corpus has four identifiers. Um, the LDC catalog number, which has always been, um, there's always been an LDC identifier, it's a unique. ID that takes into account the year something's been published, the data type L for lexicon here, and then the number of that data type in the series. This would have been the first lexicon published in 2016. We see also an ISBN number as the next identifier. Um, back in 1993, when LDC's catalog uh, launched and LDC was really the first language resource repository, and there were 
other digital repositories, but they were still growing and then small or beginning. So, so the idea was that the closest analogy for how um, LDC's catalog should be organized would be books. And uh, so ISBNs cover books. And so LDC purchased a stack of ISBN numbers that it could assign to its data sets. And in fact, only just ran out of them uh, a year or so ago. So um, the bulk of the, the data sets in our catalog uh, actually uh, have ISBN numbers, although again, within the last year or so they don't. And, and I should just mention that the whole metadata schema that we use here really is built on the Dublin Core metadata, which is again, is a standard system for cataloging books resource and, and, and other kinds of resources. Um, the next identifier is called ISLRN. That's um, in, an international uh, standard that's equivalent to the ISBN specifically for language resources. And then there's the DOI, Digital Object, Object Identifier, which I'm sure is familiar to most of you. So again, you see the detailed metadata that's here. Um, the idea again being that you can take at a glance what's in this corpus, gives you information to decide if this is something that's of interest to you. Um, online documentation is another uh, key feature. Uh, you see the field called online documentation. You click on that link and that will take you to usually the Corpus README and there may be some other information about the Corpus there. Again, you can drill down and see further information. There's licensing information. So this tells um, a potential user what um, what license agreement would have to be signed. In this case, um, it says that the LDC standard non-member license agreement would be signed. So what this means is that this corpus, um, all of our corpus can be licensed by non-members. In this case, the licensing is, is governed by our standard non-member user agreement. Any members who license this corpus, their use would be governed by the terms of the membership agreement. There's a citation, uh, you see that there. Um, many of you may be aware that there's been a move in the community in general that data sets or corpora should be cited to the same extent that uh, one would cite other uh, articles in a research paper uh, and some conferences and um, I, I believe even some journals may be requiring that now. So this is a uh, suggested citation for LDC data. We also have a field called related works. And if you click on the link when it's unclicked, it's called view. When it's clicked, as you see here, it's opened up. The idea of this is to show the user any other related data sets uh, or other information that might assist the user in finding similar resources. So in this case, we see that there are two other lexicons of um, Manding languages in the catalog. And we also see that the field linguist toolbox is um, part of this particular corpus. So now we can move on um, and, and take a closer look and we'll start with LDC's West African uh, language resources. And here, as I indicated, and as we just saw, uh, Ella, we have three Manding language lexicons um, in the catalog. Manding languages spoken in areas of Guinea, Mali, Liberia, Senegal, um, Ivory Coast and Burkina Faso. Uh, and uh, you can see that these were published over a series of years from 2005 through 2016. Um, Moaka Khan, which was the first one, um, is, um, has about 4,500 entries and uses the International Phonetic Alphabet for transcription. Uh, there's tone marking to support multiple research applications and bi-directional English and French glosses recognizing the Francophone nature of this region. Uh, and we see references to toolbox and the data is also presented in XML. So um, similar setups for the next two, Manika Khan and Bamana Khan, except that Latin-based transcription was chosen there. And the documentation explains why these different transcription systems were chosen in those cases. Um, we also have um, a corpus called the Global Yoruba Lexical Database. Uh, and this is an interesting corpus. Um, it's got definitions in English translations for over 450,000 words from Yoruba and its variants. So Yoruba, in addition to being a major language of Nigeria and Benin and also spoken in Togo and Ghana, um, has um, a history as a language of the Atlantic slave trade. And so the idea here was to represent 
the different variants um, in the diaspora of Yoruba. So the corpus contains Lukumi, which is um, a liturgical language, I believe in Cuba, sort of mixed in with Spanish. Uh, Gullah, which is um, a variant spoken on the southeastern coast of the United States, and Trinidadian Yoruba, which uh, is an example of um, a Caribbean variant of, of Yoruba. Uh, and then uh, we also have uh, three corpora, actually, uh, of Bantu languages, specifically Dashang and Agamba, and these are phonological and phonetic transcripts for, for tone paradigms. Um, now we'll move to another set of language resources um, from the U.S. government Lorelei project. Um, the, these resources were developed by LDC in that project. Lorelei stands for Low Resource Languages for Emergent Incidents. So the idea there was um, the notion that one could build language packs across a range of different languages from different areas of the world. Um, that would then enable um, researchers to build systems uh, for, um, for situations like a natural disaster or a disease outbreak, some emerging critical situation. There were 24 languages in that program and LDC developed language packs for those languages. So they were based on data that consisted of discussion forum, news, social network, web blogs, and reference. There was a monolingual corpus in the pack, part of which was translated into English. Um, there was found parallel text, words from English text that were translated into the target language, um, uh, a, a, a series of various annotations, first for entities, and then um, what was deemed to be additional annotation, some cement, simple semantic annotation, something called situation frames, which was peculiar to this particular project and entity linking. Um, the PACs also had lexical resources, grammatical sketch, a grammatical sketch and tools. So as you can see here um, across the program, uh, there were actually um, eight African languages. I only show six here, but I'll explain I, I, I left off too, so. Uh, that was inadvertent. But first, Swahili and Zulu, which were published in 2023, Kinyarwanda, Wolof, Akan. Um, Yoruba is coming. And I also just neglected to add here that um, there's also, uh, this project also covered Amharic and Somali, and we're expecting to release those um, full language packs soon as well. So I think Yoruba will be released probably next year, and um, Amharic and Somali will follow soon after that. Um, moving on now to, um, uh, I thought it would be helpful to take a look at some of the Lorelei packs uh, in a little more detail. And I think what this illustrates, which is true for any language, but what it illustrates in, in terms of um, maybe African languages is the variation that can happen in terms of available resources. And then how do, um, how can researchers, you know, sort of accommodate for that? So for instance, um, and there were two kinds of packs that LDC developed. One was called a representative language pack. This was meant to be um, basically broad overview of data and annotation and was used more in the nature of training data for this project. So representative packs were made available to project participants during the course of the project. And um, in um, then there were incident language packs. And in uh, for that, uh, that was more of a, that was the test um, language, sort of in the nature of a surprise language. So LDC would assemble the incident pack, and then it was um, afterwards um, presented to performers in a timed situation where they opened it and had, I think, about two weeks to process the data and submit their system for analysis. So we see, for instance, um, in the Zulu representative language pack, Zulu is a language that has a fair number of resources and, and most of these resources came from the web, which is pretty much the, you know, the principal way we collect data, uh, it seems, these days. Um, there were about, there are over 5 million words of monolingual text in that pack, and around 750,000 were translated into English. Um, 
There were there are 2.7 million words of found Zulu English parallel text, uh, about 70,000 70, of which were translated, uh, Zulu words translated from English data. And then we see about 100,000 words annotated for named entities and about 25% of those, of those also received the additional um, annotation. The language pack for Wolof um, illustrates um, a case where uh, there were um, fewer resources available uh, for, um, for putting the pack together. So Wolof has um, around 225,000 words of monolingual text and all of those were translated into English. About 115,000 words translated from English data 15,000 words annotated for named entities and about half then with additional annotation. So Kinyarwanda being an incident language, um, the pack is constructed a little differently, almost 12 million words of monolingual text, 35,000 words of English monolingual text, and we see 3.4 million words of parallel and comparable parallel text, uh, as well as an additional 50,000 words um, each of English and Kinyarwanda that were um, annotated for um, the full annotation um, schema. Um, next were, are some language resources that um, LDC is distributes um, from the US government um, Babel program. That's the US, um, government agency, IARPA, that sponsored that program. So the purpose of, of Babel was similar to Lorelei, although uh, a bit broader and also mainly covering speech. But again, this idea that if one took a certain range of languages across different kinds of languages um, and had language packs developed for them and systems developed for those particular languages, that then when new key um, events occurred, and you can see here that Babel bent, was meant to um, have systems that could be rapidly applied to support keyword search over, over speech. Um, then the idea is, is then that those um, systems should be extensible enough to take a new language and work with it. So, um, and I think that, you know, maybe the jury is still out on this approach in general, but in any event, um, Babel had um, covered 25 languages. LDC distributes all 25 language packs. Um, the content there are around 200 hours of conversational and scripted telephone speech with transcripts. Um, the speakers um, were basically, um, e were of equal gender distribution. They ranged in age from teens through around 60 years of age. They use various handsets in multiple environments. The transcription methodology would have varied based on the language. And as I say, we distribute all these language packs. And um, I can tell you that the US government was very supportive of the idea that these should be broadly distributed in the community. Uh, and so they are available to anyone as all of our data is, but um, at a, at a non-member fee of US $25. So in this case, um, Babel uh, included four African languages, all of which again are in the catalog in the years that I've indicated, Swahili and Zulu, which are um, were also represented in Lorelei, Ibu and Dolu. Um, so next, um, I'd like to just stop a minute and take a look at some North African language resources. LDCs, uh, even though we're not really focusing heavily on those today, um, but over the years, LDC's done quite a bit of work in Arabic, both modern standard Arabic and in the dialects. And in North Africa, in, uh, that would mean specifically Egyptian, Moroccan, and Tunisian Arabic. And of course, it's also the case that some of the languages we're talking about today and other languages in the continent are also written in Arabic script. Um, so um, for uh, Egyptian Arabic, uh, we've collected conversational telephone speech, some of which is transcribed, discussion forum, SMS chat data, all of that's been released as either as source documents and then as separate annotated resources. And those um, and those annotated resources include parallel text, tree bank, co-reference, and so on. Uh, in Moroccan Arabic, we have conversational telephone speech. 
Uh, and a new corpus released this year, Moroccan, the Moroccan Arabic English Lexical Database. Very interesting um, corpus. This is part of a collaboration between LDC and Georgetown University Press to update some um, dialectal Arabic dictionaries that were released in the 1960s. Um, we also have a large telephone collection um, that um, was um, collected to support language identification research, basically for languages or dialects that would have been considered mutually intelligible or maybe closely related. So there's the corpus here is called Arabic group uh, and it's got speech from Iraqi Levantine and what's called Maghrebi dialects. Um, I think the metadata could be better in terms of um, teasing out um, which part of the Maghreb some of the speakers were. It's not as good as it could be, um, but um, it, it, is another, um, it is another resource from that region. Uh, now I'm just gonna switch gears a little bit uh, and just wanted to share with you some thoughts about challenges um, of African language research based on LDC's experience and um, collecting and uh, distributing some of the resources that we've looked at so far. So I think um, it's still the case that for some language, some languages, data scarcity is an issue. Uh, and I would say that um, text is an area that can continue to be a challenge uh, to the extent that um, a lot of text now is collected from the web by people in, in our community and the bigger language re, uh, research community, then um, there are languages that are just not well represented on the web. And so that, that, creates, um, that can create um, an issue. Um, because writing systems aren't established for all languages, and this is true of any language without a writing system, not just African languages, but orthography is um, can be a challenge. And um, consistent with that is, well, then what is what choice will be made? And is that something that will be applied across various data sets? Getting back to the idea of the FAIR principles that data should be interoperable. So I think um, so I think that's something to keep in mind. Um, there is just in terms of um, languages on the African continent, there are just so many, there are many dialects. It's across a large area, diverse geographical. Um, conditions and maybe political conditions as well, which can sometimes pose challenges when one is considering field work or data collection. Um, at the same time, uh, the good news and really as our systems have gotten better uh, and uh, better, again, uh, online um, methods and ways of collecting and sharing data, um, we can see that maybe some novel approaches to recruitment and elicitation are possible. Uh, and one of which that, uh, of which we've um, had just uh, a little bit experience or at least talked to different collaborators about are using mobile phones in the field. People may not have access to a personal computer, but most people have access to a phone. Um, if they can uh, access an app that allows them to um, enter speech, type in some text, that's a way um, to do data collection um, in, the, in this area, uh, as well as crowd or citizen science platforms in which people can volunteer um, their language expertise um, to assist translation and other kinds of tasks. These uh, African languages are also characterized um, by complicated morphology and phonology. And in relation to that, the, the various processes that are related to that, such as segment deletion and vowel harmony, nasalization, word contraction, and as well as complex pronoun systems, all of which um, are going to tie into ideas about how, how they're presented or annotated and so on. Um, as we saw with Yoruba, in addition to many dialects, there can be lots of, there can be variants and uh, and maybe diaspora forms that one might want to take into account. And I think in the case of the Yoruba lexicon specifically, um, it was the intent that this should be as much a cultural resource as it as it is a lexicon, which um, which is the reason one of the motivations for including um, 
the, um, the information about variants and also lots of background about how they came about. Um, I think uh, of another challenge, which can be true of many languages, not just the ones we're talking about today, um, are just insufficient funding for them, uh, lack of resources, although I think this is growing. I think there are more resources available um, today than there were, let's say, 10 years ago for sure, um, and limited access to online materials. So again, I think that that gets to a couple of points back to the beginning about just uh, not enough web text and also maybe the fact that not everyone who wants to uh, access these materials has can do so because they, they don't have um, access to a personal computer, internet um, connectivity can be problematic and so on. Um, so now moving to our last topic, we'll be sharing data through LDC. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, LDC, the LDC catalog um, depends on contributions from researchers around the world. And um, we've seen some of those uh, in, in the talk today. Um, our mission is to basically publish and preserve data from the community and then at the same time, make sure that the community has broad access. So um, I'm here to say, if you have data, if you're collecting data, if you're thinking of collecting data, um, please keep in mind that LDC can be a distribution point uh, for, for your data set. And why would you do that? I think there, there are lots of good reasons for doing that. First, you'd have access to a large global network. Our newsletter announces new publications and is sent to over 20,000 recipients. Uh, and these include uh, people working in the fields of uh, human language technologies, NLP, et cetera, around the world. Um, we're a permanent data archive, as I mentioned. So that means that data that's just, that was contributed in 1993 or 2003 is still in that same uh, form as it was when it was um, deposited with us in those years. And we continue to apply best practices to storage, to uh, curation, to preservation. Uh, and so that means that your data set will be secure at LDC. Um, we've shown uh, earlier that it's um, pretty easy to find LDC data. And once you find it, it's you're going to get a lot of information about that data set. So people are going to know um, by looking at it, what's important uh, in there, whether that's something that's useful for them or not, but it, it will be transparent to the user. Also, um, data rights, uh, we don't ask that data contributors um, give us exclusive rights to distribution. So our rights are non-exclusive, which means that you, the data con contributor, the corpus developer can share your data set through other means as well. Um, we've also, of course, after 30 years, know a little bit about publishing and licensing. So we've developed uh, a robust licensing model and uh, one that can be adjusted as needed um, to uh, take care of maybe some other limitations such as non-commercial use across the board, other things like that that can be applied to, um, to the users for your data set. Um, to find out more information about this, we have um, we have a fair amount of uh, information on our website. We have a section called providing data and the link is here. And in that section, you can see information about the publication process as well as documentation guidelines and technical guidelines. Um, we also have a web portal called LDC submissions. So this is the place where if um, you're ready to um, submit a corpus, uh, you can do so through this portal. You register for an account, create a submission, can upload a data sample, and then communicate directly with our publications group. And that's how we manage the submissions processes through the portal. Um, so this actually brings me 
to the end, pretty much, of the talk. So um, in conclusion, um, I think uh, one, one thing I'd like to say is just, I, you know, I think we at LDC see a great future for African language resources. There's more funding for this work. There are more researchers working on it. There are more platforms for accessing and sharing data and more internet resources as well. Um, I think it's also worth mentioning that it wasn't that long ago where, you know, mundane things like fonts and encoding uh, were real um, obstacles to research and a lot and those those have been um, resolved to a great extent, again, making making research easier and um, easier to share and reuse. Um, and I and as someone uh, representing LDC, I again have to say uh, uh, in in just as a general comment that um, even where we are today with generative technologies and large language models, we still feel that curated resources are important and they play an important role in this field um, using uh, data that can be um, subdivided for training, development, and evaluation. Uh, and the evaluation process in general is a valuable way to develop technologies. Um, the permanence of data at LDC is something, again, that we, um, it's the core of our mission and something that we'll always continue to do. And in terms of availability and access, we can always, and we do, um, have controls uh, and limitations as needed. So um, that, that ends my talk. Uh, my the part of the presentation piece today. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you so, so much, Denise. That was a truly enlightening talk.